This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale. I am a writer and film critic and today I'm going to be talking to the writer Alison McCaw whose latest book, Making the Best Years of Our Lives, a Hollywood classic that inspired a nation, is a deep dive into the classic film by William Wyler uh, about three veterans of World War II returning to their, uh, to their lives and to returning to America. Uh, it's a wonderful read and a, a really good celebration of a film that has been a little bit neglected, I think, despite its initial success. Um, if you enjoyed the re episode, please remember to like, uh, subscribe, tweet, do all the things you can do to spread the word. I'm sorry, I have to apologize for not uh, doing the episode on time this this week, but um, hopefully it won't detract from your enjoyment. In fact, you'll probably savor it all the more. Okay, so please enjoy the conversation. I first saw Best Years as, as best as I can remember, um, probably 30 years ago when I was a master's student at the University of Texas. Um, you know, it was just one of the topic film classes that we were taking. And, um, you know, I was training to be a film professor. And so you, you see everything, you know, you to become trained. And you don't, I think if you're honest, you don't like everything in the same way. And this one really just struck me. Um, felt very, I don't want to say radical, but in a way it felt radical, you know, and what it was doing visually and what it was saying and how the characters were dressed and interacted with one another. And then, of course, there was Harold Russell, um, who was the real life veteran. I mean, they're all veterans or many veterans, as many as uh, Weiler could get on this film. And that was really uh profound for me because I knew a lot about the Breen office and the PCA, the Production Code Administration, and was like, how did this come about, you know? So I had always been interested in the film and loved it. And then as I started to teach, I would just, you know, put it in every syllabus I could, um, you know, American independent film, uh, even film noir, you can really, you know, it's very versatile. Yeah, <laughs> Um, a, cross a crossover film in many it's ways. It's amazing, really. And my students really pretty much across the board reacted as I had when I first saw it. And I guess when I was finishing up my second book and looking around for what to do next, um, you know, I thought, well, maybe it's time to write about how this film came to be. It must have been great fun having a, a proper deep dive as well, because this, this is a really uh detailed you know hist history of the making of book it really was i mean it's it's a little daunting you know i knew how much i i know how beloved the film is and um that was an interesting issue too because you know on the one hand when i was pitching this project people were like i don't know you know do people even remember this film and you know you could get up in arms and say, of course they do, but does the general public remember this film? I'm not so sure, you know, and I know people still, di still disagree with me, but I'm going to stand by that. Um, but for those who do know the film, yes, it's, it's almost sacred. In fact, I've received emails from people um, in terms of setting up events who'll say, so you've really tackled the big one, you know, so it's interesting to see, you know, oh yeah, how people feel about it. Um, and yeah, to do a deep dive, to sit there with all the files, to go through the production schedule, to read the memos. It really, it's a journey. You go on a journey with the film, you go on the journey with the people who made it, and it's, it's, it becomes your life for a while, definitely. Well, speaking of that sort of um, popularity or, or otherwise, or where exactly it stands in the, in the realm of the cultural landscape, 
realm of the cultural landscape. Excellent. That's um, keep that, <laughs> keeping keeping that one in. Um, I imagine some of our listeners may not have uh, seen the film. So should we give a, just a, a basic sort of pricey a sort of f- a feel for the film, uh, so that yes. they, they can go away and watch it after after this conversation? So it's three veterans from different branches of the military meet um, when they catch the same transport plane back to their hometown, Boone City. So there's Dana Andrews. He plays Fred. He's an Air Force captain heading home to Marie, who is the uh, fun-loving blonde, as I describe her in the book. He married shortly before heading overseas. Homer Parrish um, is a sailor who lost both of his hands when his aircraft carrier was torpedoed. And Al Stevenson, played by Frederick March, uh, is a former banker. He has a family. Uh, He's eager to return to them. His wife is played by Myrna Loy, but he's very conflicted about resuming his job at the bank. So the film is about these three men who meet um, and how their paths keep crossing um, as they all try to readjust and reintegrate. Um, and then Peggy, uh, Fred, uh, Al and Millie's daughter, uh, played by Teresa Wright, she and Fred meet and uh, they develop a relationship that sort of adds to his already rocky marriage. Um, and I like to say the film ends with a wedding. That's all I'll say about that. And it brings the three veterans back together and from my point of view, it offers a hopeful but very realistic path forward for each of the characters in the film. I, I, I mean, they, they, it's such an interesting story because it's so uh, kind of like it, its format is kind of unconventional as well. The way that you have these mm-hmm. stories and then they separate and go off and then they come back together. Um, mm-hmm. And there's with the different ages as well there's a sort of sense of you know either older brothers or even that the um frederick marsh character is maybe a little bit of a a father figure to the other two as well yes yeah um yeah and it starts you know they it's such a great way to bring them in having them ride in that taxi back um and dropping them off one by one you know and introducing us to their homes their families their lives um, and we see for each of them up front the obstacles they'll immediately face. Um, it's really pretty amazing that this film was shot with you know so many players in it, so many big names, and really principal production was just like a hundred days. Um, you know, given all of the things going on post-war, there was something I didn't even really write about. There were strikes going on within the industry. Um, it was it was a very I don't know volatiles the word I want to use um, but I'm going to go with it at this point. Okay? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, there is a lot going on, um, so it's kind of amazing. You know, Goldwyn was wanted to get this movie going um, really since the end of I believe '44 and '45. McKinley Cantor was hired to write a novel based on a Time Magazine article. And then um, from there, Goldwyn was putting a lot of pressure on Robert Sherwood, the playwright and screenwriter, um, to adapt it. He was very resistant. He thought the idea would be out of date. Um, and, And Weiler, really, with his own injuries from the war, helped convince Sherwood um, that, you know, this, this will be a timely film when it comes out. I, I think he was nervous about that too. Mm, mm, yeah, it's this kind of surprising point because you sort of nowadays you think, okay, we're going to be making nine eleven films for twenty years. You know, you don't think, mm-hmm. okay, we better get one out really quickly, otherwise no one will be interested in the Second World War. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, but I think also Weiler was experiencing that. He had made documentaries during the war, um, and he had a second one. His first one Memphis, about the Memphis Bell was amazing. Did you know, did big business for a war film, a, a, you know, a documentary made for the war effort. And then Thunderbolt, his second one, he was having a hard time getting that out there. They're like, eh, that was so last year, you know? And so I think there was that sense, you know, there was definitely this push. I mean, women were being 
you know, moved out of their jobs to welcome the men back. I think there was a sense of let's move forward. Mm, I suppose I, I suppose we could sort of think of it now as like if somebody wants to. Um, well, I'll give you a very concrete example from my own life. I wrote a novel about a global pandemic. Uh, which I completed my final draft uh, February 2020, and uh, oh, yeah, exactly. And, it was and you. It, no, you. No, nobody will ever read it because uh, my agent just went. Nobody wants to read about pandemics now. And it was like, God damn it! I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's that, but um, you know, one of my first events for this book was a screening of the film at the Austin Film Society on Memorial Day. And afterward, um, a young guy came up to me and he had served in Afghanistan and he had just read about the event, you know, online and the paper or whatever, never seen the film, came, saw it, was blown away by it. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, very gratifying to me like yes this film does still speak to people and especially perhaps the people who need it most yeah i that that's what one thing that i think is a, a sort of injustice in the sense of it fading it, to some degree from the from the conversation is that in many ways it's much more contemporary and much more relevant to today than say Mrs. Miniver or or Casablanca or a film. I mean I love Casablanca it's, it's you know for all the rest of it but I don't look to Casablanca as a sort of like oh this has got something to tell me about war you know it, it, it hasn't it's 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 a complete fantasy but um uh, the best years of our lives it has something to say about war today and as you say afghanistan iraq uh you know i'm sure people will be suffering from similar problems in russia and ukraine uh in years to come well it's it's about war but it doesn't focus on war you know it focuses on these people and 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 their struggles and their relationships and i think that is one of the things that helps keep it fresh um i think there's an understated quality to uh, the acting, um, there are some bits, you know, that that aren't my favorite. I will admit, but I mean, as a whole, I think it is. I mean, I think of Harold Russell, and I think he's really important in the film um, for the obvious reason, but also because he does bring this kind of unstudied quality to it. Um, and Weiler was very keen to preserve that. You know, Goldwyn had wanted to give and was in the process of getting um, acting lessons for Harold Russell, who played Homer Parrish. And, you know, Weiler was really ticked off when he found that out because he, you know, wanted to preserve that sense of here's someone fairly fresh to the screen. He had done the military training film, Diary of a Sergeant, but that's very different than a Hollywood film with, you know, people like Dana Andrews in your scene or Frederick March. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, so this is the the guy who um, suffered a severe injury during sort of training. It was a he was sort of defusing a bomb and it blew up in his hand. Well, he was getting ready to train to teach a class. Actually, he was at Camp McCall in um, I always forget. I think it's North Carolina, not South Carolina. And he uh, he wasn't even supposed to be teaching that day. It was D Day, actually. Um, and one of the reasons that I think there was the accident uh, was that the uh, things that he was using the the glass cap, this this stuff had been laying out on the grass. Lunch had been a little bit long because they were getting um, briefed about D Day. Yeah. So as he was getting his supplies ready to teach this class. Um, they blew up in his hands. And so one of the things he, Russell struggled with in the immediate, you know, rehab at Walter Reed was the fact that he was stateside. You know, there wasn't sort of some big romantic heroic story attached to how he got injured. It was, you know, something pretty uh, basic. Yeah, but I, I remember reading somewhere that more soldiers died in traffic accidents in the mm. Second World War than died fighting yeah. in the second world war but the fact of the matter is you know that traffic is a consequence of the war it's not like they're right. they're, they're walking down you know 42nd street and i'm you know i'm not talking necessarily about the reception of his um of his injury i'm talking about his you know interior psychological 
response. Run. Everybody has imposter syndrome. It's that, yeah. every, you know, even even somebody who is, you would think, come on, you, you, you know, you, you've paid a t terrible price and you were, you were serving your country. It doesn't matter that you were training people or you were fighting, you were still serving, you know. Right. right. But, and he, but he, has and he gives an absolutely you know uh, stunning performance i mean he, the word performance feels a bit bit wrong for what he does but that right. honesty that wyler saw sort of shines through the screen right yeah i mean for me it's in his face you know it's he's got this open kind of face um I believe he was 32 at the time that he made this film. And it's there's just a freshness. He looks, it's he's got a very baby face, you know. So I think that youth comes through as well. Um, and you know, I've said this before, I think this is more of a recent, relatively recent realization that um my dad became disabled late in life. And there's a scene in the film at the soda counter where Homer you know, a guy really wants to talk to him, you know, about the war and Homer's trying to have a conversation with Fred, but he can tell that this guy is, you know, breathing down his neck and he turns to address him and he just says, you know, hi, um, how are you? And in that moment for me, that is a moment that, you know, every person with a difference, a disabled person in this case, that's there every day and having to kind of smooth the social interaction. I saw that with my father a lot, you know, how he would put people at ease. And it's something that Harold Russell worked on and learned from um, another vet, a World War I vet named Charlie McGonigal. Um, at Walter Reed, they had shown the film um, Meet McGonigal, another training film. And then they brought in McGonagall and um, he and Russell developed a friendship and it was very important to like Russell saw him out in the world and, you know, I think took that as, as a very hopeful, positive sign. Like I too could be, maybe become successful in whatever I do. And, you know, it's a lot of hard work, but, you know, McGonagall did it. So he, he, he worked behind the scenes, you know, and developing jokes and icebreakers and, you know, getting better with his hooks. And that is just, I think because I saw it from my dad's side, it's exhausting. And so for me, back to that soda counter, soda counter scene, that is a realism there, you know, to, to see that, that, behavior. And I think it's that sense that just uh, open approach that really keeps this film feeling fresh and relatable. Yeah, absolutely. How, uh, that idea as well that you have to have a strategy for every part of your life, even if it's, you know, everything we take for, for granted. I mean, that's where, I guess that's where privilege comes into it. Yeah. I mean, forget trying to, you know, relearn how to, um, tie your shoes or open a door. In fact, one, there was a scene where, you know, Wyler was the one in shooting the woodshed scene where um, Homer and Wilma, his girlfriend are, you know, having one of their first <clears throat> confrontations. And there was a lot of back and forth between Wyler and Russell about how to open the door the right way, you know? And I think Wyler finally kind of got out of his director trance and was like, okay, yeah, you know how to open a door with your hooks. I'm going to let you do that. You know? <laughs> I mean, that, that's, um, that's something that's very interesting as well is, is William Wyler had this reputation at the time for being this hard director of, of, of you know, we think of Stanley Kubrick as, as one of those directors who demanded repeated takes and he doesn't really sort of lay off on, on Homer at all, does he? No, I mean, I think, like any good director, you know, you use what you have to build what you're looking for, to build tension, to build anger in the character. Um, and I think it was definitely, you know, there was a definite method to the madness of shooting this scene then and then this scene later, you know, the big kitchen to bedroom scene sequence at the end between Homer and Wilma came toward the end of shooting, you know, to really kind of make sure that, as I write in the book, the two most inexperienced performers had, you know, were the heavy lifting of that big scene. Um, and that, 
was shot later in production to give them, I think, a chance to get comfortable with each other, although I'm not sure that ever happened between Kathy O'Donnell and um, Harold Russell. Not that they, you know, hated each other. It's just it, there was an age gap and it just, mm. you know, sh- I just don't think they ever gelled in the way, say, Russell did with somebody like Dana Andrews. Mm. Mm-hmm. And and I mean that that's one of the fascinating things about the story that, that you tell of the behind the scenes is how this guy's coming in from the army as a veteran. Although having said that, you know, as you said earlier, there are lots of veterans on set, including Wyler himself. Um, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, his role has been made famous by the yeah, not that it wasn't already famous, but the the recent Netflix documentary Five Come Home and the Mark mm-hmm. Harris book. Mm-hmm. see previous episodes <laughs> for the uh for the story of that but he came home himself injured as well not as visibly as um as harold but but still um with an injury that he thought was was disastrous catastrophic in fact right I and mean, he lost his hearing and then even just the process you know you lose your hearing other injuries, other people, other vets with injuries perhaps could be flown home. He couldn't fly. He had to be sent back on a ship. So it was sort of this metaphor, you know, this long, torturous journey to get back. Um, couldn't really communicate with his wife well over the phone. Um, a lot of intermediaries. And in fact, that was something that Catherine Weiler, uh, Willie and Tally's oldest child, told me was that as I was saying to her, you know, I really feel like part of this story is going to be about your parents' relationship. I see your mom sort of representing the women, the girlfriends, the wives, the siblings. Um, and she had sort of said, oh, yeah, you know, my mom had to take all those calls, especially in the beginning, and kind of, you know, be the translator for my father, um, uh, which is interesting, you know, uh, changes that whole dynamic. Uh, Willie was older than his wife. And, you know, of course, he had this big Hollywood career. And he was very, he was despondent when he came back. Um, he found a workaround on the set that helped him hear in his um, right ear. He lost hearing in both his ears initially, but the left one came back. I mean, in fact, I was just got an email um, from Catherine uh, Weiler. And she she's, I used this phrase about, you know, she's like, we were always fighting as kids to, to, to be on dad's good ear during dinner, which I thought was such a great image, you know, so they could talk to their father, you know, they're like, get my turn to be on his right side, you know, or on his left side rather. Yeah, absolutely. I did that must have been i mean it must have been hard from from all points of view but the idea that he he managed to to work his way through um i mean this so so before this film he'd made mrs miniver immediately before the war yes uh, or, or before uh america's entry into the war i should say yes uh and he he'd established himself as a kind of prestigious director prior to prior to that is that oh, right? definitely i mean he was under contract to Goldwyn, you know, he came over in teens. Um, his mother was a distant cousin of Carl Lamley, head of Universal, um, and he worked his way up. Um, I believe he started working for Goldwyn in the 30s. His first film for him might have been These Three. Um, they had an interesting relationship, you know, maybe a typical sort of adversarial, um, you know, bad boyfriend kind of relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's a lot of back and forth, let's say. There's a lot of back and forth, yeah. And and one thing I found interesting was that, you know, his wife said, I, he was sort of pointing out sort of the, the genius of the system, you know, that there there's something to be said for that kind of friction in terms of creative, um, how it affects creativity and the final product. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Willie had this career, um, but he was very eager to be involved in the war. And then after Pearl Harbor, I mean, he has said Pearl Harbor came to my rescue. He definitely wanted to be involved. And, and that gave him a way in, even though he was, you know, overage, the overage major, as um, I think the guys of the Memphis Bell called him. Um, you know, he had just had a second child. She was an infant when he left. And um, yeah, but he went and massive physical courage. I mean, going up in those airplanes to make those films involved, you know, yeah. He was uh, a daredevil. Un- I mean, he was courage. 
always, I mean, yes to what you said, but he was also, you know, always looking for the thrill kind of thing. You know, I sat there and looked through tons of pictures of crazy skiing antics and all of these things that he clearly loved to do. And I think going up in a bomber was, was sort of just next level daredevil (laughs) until, you know, until then you see, you know, people not coming back Mm -hmm. basically once you're back on the ground. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, that's where the real courage comes in, I guess, is going, going the first time, you can sort of screw screw your courage to the sticking place, but going the second and the third time, knowing the reality of the situation must be must be dreadful. And I don't think he even saw himself as particularly courageous. I think he saw himself as, you know, I'm in a pretty cushy setup here, not doing what these guys have to do. You know, I'm filming it and I am in harm's way, but things could be a lot worse. Mm. Mm, absolutely absolutely um and so when you one of the things that i think really lasts in the movie and um uh, and and lasts to today is is the way it's a kind of you, you were saying earlier it's a sort of it's, you can cross over into a lot of genres you can teach it mm-hmm. in a lot of courses um it's kind of a, a this is america film as well a sort of state of the nation film if you like um mm especially in the latter part, but even, you know, the fact that you've got these guys from different social classes doing different jobs and, you know, one's in a bank, one's a, in a soda clerk, you know, um, <laughs> and, and, they, and they've all got these sort of kind of significant problems as well. You know, there's a, there's PTSD, although it wasn't called that, there's, there's the physical handicap and there's alcoholism. Yeah. Yeah. There's, Yes, there's a lot to choose from, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever your issue, I think you can find relatable, you know, you're not, you're an adult young woman, and you're not married, there's a character for you, you know. Mm. Um, so I think there is, in addition to the way Weiler liked to shoot scenes, you know, Andre Bazan, the film theorist, talked about his style being very democratic, because he loved to use that deep focus and let the viewer to some extent look around find a place find a way into the scene but obviously you know guiding the viewer too um so i think that that comes through on many levels narratively formally all of them in the film and and um let's talk a little bit about the other two characters because we talked a little bit about um the the Homer character. Um, mm-hmm. uh, let's talk about Al and Fred. Is it? I'm getting mm-hmm. it right. Mm-hmm. So Dana Andrews plays. He plays Fred. Fred, exactly. Yeah. So he he had his own, and just just in the way we were talking about um, Harold earlier on, he has his own kind of internal demons, even as he's uh, doing the, um, even as doing his role in the film. Yeah, he had a drinking problem and. Um it became somewhat of an issue during shooting and Weiler took him aside and talked to him. And I think it was that sort of directness and, and not threatening him, just saying, you know, here's, here's how we can handle this, you know? And I think that made a big impression on Dana Andrews. Um, I know somebody said, you know, I said, so he's, you know, the story goes, he stopped drinking for the remainder of the film and it was, I think at the event you were at, Caroline said, did he, you know, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to get into policing Dana Andrews, you know, let's just say that he managed to cut back enough to have it not be a problem um, in the making of the movie. And, you know, Teresa Wright in later interviews talked a lot about that, you know, cause she, they obviously shared several scenes together and talked about what it was like, you know, waiting for him, um, working with him then. But he got it together very quickly. And, you know, if you think about it, he had done um, Laura, I think came out in 1944. I mean, his, his career was at a very interesting point. I think he was, you know, he was definitely one of Goldwyn's top people. Um, so there was a weight on him with this project. And um, 
this character, you know, these are heavy characters in a lot of ways. You know, he has to go through that bomber scene where he, you know, relives this moment. And that scene is really interesting because, you know, Robert Sherwood, the screenwriter, would put some direction in the script for certain scenes. And Goldwyn was just like adamant to Weiler, you cannot change a word of this. I made a promise to Sherwood. It was an interesting relationship between Goldwyn and Sherwood. And then Weiler sort of getting caught there. Um, and in that particular scene where he has that moment, that catharsis in the, the bomber, the abandoned bomber graveyard, um, there is very little direction there uh, written. There's a lot of voiceover that was supposed to be included, which was cut way back, I think, beneficially for sure. Um, but it was interesting to me that you know, there was there wasn't a lot of direction there. Um, whereas, for instance, in this the, the later scene where the kitchen to the bedroom scene with Homer and Wilma, there is direction down to this is how the light should fall on his face when he's lying in bed at the end of the scene. So it was very interesting. I think Sherwood was sort of like, OK, you people on the ground have been in a recent war and and can speak to this better perhaps than I can mm. in this moment. Mm. Um, that's what I took away from mm. reading how the screen direction was, you know, very minimal in that sequence. And that's such a stunning sequence just in terms of the imagery. It's just like it's when a it's when a, a metaphor is I don't know if there's a technical term for this, but when a metaphor is the thing itself as well mm -hmm. as a metaphor you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. it, it is it, it's like the titanic the, the titanic is like the titanic and also <laughs> the titanic you know and this you know graveyard of flying fortresses and bombers is a metaphor for everything that is now redundant and and ruined but is also um is also actually just physically that you know Right. Well, and it wasn't just, you know, that they were in pieces, they were yeah. missing pieces, you know, so that's one step further. And I think, you know, writing about writing this book and writing about that scene, going through all of the script versions and all of that gave me a better appreciation for how important the um, soundtrack is in that particular sequence. I mean, visually, yes, it's very arresting, but there is the moment where the camera's moving in. I think it starts from behind Dana Andrews and then we cut to him. Um, it, it is this build that comes through with the sound, the image and the editing um, in that moment. It's all very important and it just becomes this sort of amazing moment in the film. Um, and while I never found the, you know, the the rosebud that would tell me that, yes, William Wyler really wanted that scene as the final shot of the film, um, I found some things and some correspondence that made me think that he might have been leaning that way instead of going with the wedding, you know, going with something a little <clears throat> um, not as conventional. Um, and when I first you know, the first, I don't know, dozen times I saw this film, I remember thinking like, oh, I wish it had ended with that. Um, but now I think I have an appreciation for that final scene because it is really not just about that wedding. It's about what other people have rightly called, you know, one of the worst proposals in history. Um, and I love that. I love that. I love the film for that. I, yeah, it's a kind of, there is a kind of cushion effect to it but having said that you know i kind of need a cushion <laughs> you know, yeah. i i want I, I like having that way out of the movie rather than maybe being left too i don't know in, in a place which is too too symbolic mm, that's interesting yeah and i i've said this many times before but i had a professor in grad school terrific was, you know, a mentor and terrific writer, Tom Schatz, genius of the system, written a lot of great film books. And he always liked to say that, you know, your identification can be fluid over time and it changes as you age. And he liked to use the example of the graduate and how 
when you're young and you first see that film, you may identify with Benjamin, but as you get older, you may have more sympathy for some of the, you know, adult, the older characters. And, and I, I find that to be true. And, it, and in a way, that's like a lovely gift that you can return to movies you love and see them, you know, prismatically. Um, that's a word. See them from a different perspective. Mm. And find another way in. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I kind of, I don't know, this isn't a theory and I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it up, up as <laughs> such, but there, I think there are endings and there are endings in the sense that mm -hmm. often a film ends and, and uh, I mean, it, I mean, it ends before it's ending and mm -hmm. the rest that you're watching is actually an epilogue. It's actually not, mm -hmm. that's not the ending. That's the epilogue. That's the, that's, you know, now you can start looking for your keys and it's, it's time to go home, you know? Yes. Um, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, for me, it's probably the kitchen to bedroom sequence, right? You know, where I'm like, okay. I mean, yes, we we need the other sequence to see those bratty kids, and you know, who's going to get to sing the song and all of that fun stuff, and of course, um, Fred and Peggy. But um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to um, to think about while you're searching for your keys and grabbing your popcorn bag. <laughs> and of course, Al, the character played by Frederick March, is um, you know he's he talking about alcoholism earlier. He's he that's his sort of character. Um, that's his the problem that he's he's dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean Frederick March as well is 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 coming into this having had a career i always look at him and think of william powell for some reason i always have mm -hmm. that that sort of similar sort of thin man look to him maybe it's the the inclusion of myrna loy there too i don't know yeah, but yeah. i mean see frederick march's face is so angular and mm. in fact one of the um one of the memo well not memos telegram that Weiler sent to March soon after he signed on was you know you have to look hardened for this role mm. you know you you have to really slim down basically and he says you know I know how hard it is for men of our age you know I've gained whatever 15 pounds since I've been back but really and it was even like you know, talking about that, then going on to something like, oh, friends saw you in this movie recently and said you were never better and da, 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 you know, all the best, Willie. P.S. You got to lose weight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, Frederick March, he's, this this was such an interesting thing to me. Um, he performed for troops during the war and he tried to do some comedy and no one was really buying it. Right. So he kind of worked out this routine where he would do um, the the transformation scene from, and now I'm completely forgetting it. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jekyll, Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Mr. Hyde, yes. No. And he would do that on stage without any effects. You know, it was just all through performance. And, and um, you know, the troops love that. And, and that's so fascinating to me. And so it was sort of like, okay, I'm going to go with this. You know, this is how people see me. I'm going to go with it. Um, and there is some of that, right? There's there's humorous moments with Al in the film, for sure. There's like, to me, the one that verges on slapstick with the whole Millie getting him in bed um, when he's drunk. But then there are scenes where it's, it's very ominous, really, where the camera is on the side of his face and the shadows and you know, how's this going to play out? Is he going to go off the rails in the film? You know, audiences had already seen The Lost Weekend. So, you know, they know how things could go. Um, so again, I love the way that it, nothing, it doesn't resolve his alcoholism, you know, that's, that's going to go with him. Um, even as the movie ends, he'll have to figure that out. Again, very realistic, I think. Yeah. Um, I I mean, to go back to the metaphor of the sort of gra airplane graveyard, the idea yeah. that, that we're going to start using these to build houses now. We're going to, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to, there's still, it's still wreckage, but there's some bits of this we can use, you know, right. it's, it speaks to a sort of partial recovery, not a total recovery. Yeah. And, you know, I've heard from people who love the film, like, um, 
a favorite scene with Frederick March is the one with Myrna Loy where they're, you know, Peggy's saying in their bedroom after a night out, like, okay, you know, I've decided I'm going to break up Fred's marriage, you know, and there's that scene where he says, you know, how are you going to do that with an ax? And then it's sort of this, we get this flashback, oral flashback um, of his relationship with Millie, where they talk about, you know, what marriage is essentially, right? Or what any long partnership is, the ups and the downs and the I hate you's and the oh my gods. And, and I think that's a terrific moment. And so people have told me like, that's one of their favorite moments is that sort of um, discussion of marriage in a very realistic, but very romantic way too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think that speaks to the, the to the atmosphere of the whole film. Is you, you're, mm-hmm. this is a genuine. I mean, I know it won a ton of Oscars, and I know it did a a lot of. Um, it succeeded in 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 becoming sort of a prestigious picture, as well as you know being very commercially successful. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I I sometimes can be a bit sniffy about the Oscars, especially when it's sort of like a, a social you know crash or something like that. Not the Cronenberg, right. the Paul Haggis currently under house arrest in Italy, <laughs> um, and, and I uh, and I wonder. You want to go there, John? <laughs> oh, um, no, I, I'm not. Just, just, I'm just putting 100 percent disclosure of, <laughs> of of Paul Haggis. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, so you, I can get a bit sniffy about the 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 sort of problem picture but this is such right. it's such a, a mature and complex and nuanced way of looking at it and including saying you know throwing up its hands and saying well we're not going to solve this today right right yeah that that that's a breath of fresh air um i think mm. even today right not to wrap everything up and <laughs> Um, yeah, I write about how the Oscars, you know, the rules had changed. And so you could even argue, well, there were fewer people voting. And, and so, you know, maybe take the movie to task. Before, do those seven Oscars really mean what they would have meant in 1946? You know, one of them in 1947. I don't know. But there, in reading all of the accounts of the ceremony and um, listening to the speeches, you know, you can listen to them through the database, the um, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences website. There is this sense of a, this, this sort of euphoria building around this film and, you know, it's being embraced by the community at that point. Um, and I try to capture that in that, in the end of one chapter going into the other of this sense of wow you know Weiler's gonna get his second Oscar and and then you know Goldwyn gets the Thalberg which isn't you know a one award but it it was a nice cap to the evening and then Russell gets the two so it was Mm. kind of this this victory even though you know basically Weiler and Goldwyn weren't talking by the end of the night (laughs) Because they were arguing about percentages and such. Right, right. And, you know, then Weiler sued him. So, yeah. <laughs> I like the way Weiler sent him a note as well after he won the case. Or they settled the case out of court. And it was like, yeah. oh, there was, we had a little disagreement, but everything's fine, you know. You know, that is so funny to me. And, and I see that. I My first book was about um, the Austin film scene. And I interviewed a lot of people. Um, whose movies were sort of homegrown in Austin, but went on to, you know, big recognition like Spy Kids, Robert Rodriguez's Spy Kids, um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I remember talking to Mike Judge, you know, The Office, Beavis and Butthead. And he was Mm. saying something to me like that was one of the hardest things for him to understand about the business, you know, that you could have this, this fight in his case, it was with Fox, you know, 20th Century Fox. He said, and my agent, you know, would go toe to toe with them over something. And then he would be going that night to a Lakers game with them. And I was like, how do you do that? You know, so it's that sense of figuring out how to have that relationship, you know. Um, I think it would be immensely difficult. Um, In fact, Weiler counsels Teresa Wright about how to handle Goldwyn during this time, you know, like, he's going to do this and you've just got to do this. 
And that's how you can coexist later at some kind of event together. You know, it was something I think he had to learn and relearn. Yeah, it's one of the, it's a weird thing. It's like, um, I don't know, when you watch football games I was, and somebody is beating the other side by 5-0, the way to show them respect is not to take it easy, but to go for the seventh goal. Because yeah. if, you, if you're taking it easy, it's it's even more humiliating. It's like, no, score another one, you know. I was like, <laughs> oh man, that takes some, that's some brutal, that's some brutal ethos right there. It's, it's a very, very strange industry <laughs> uh, yeah it certainly yeah, my, my my word it certainly is um I, and yeah I, i've got to say uh having met you in austin recently i i really enjoyed going around and looking at the texas chainsaw massacre um locations that were oh good yeah yeah, yeah it's so fun to see those to walk the land because a lot of it has changed so much but um I just I just watched that new Ty West film. Is it Ty West X that is very much based in a Texas oh, yeah. chainsaw? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure where it's shot actually. Um, I don't know that either. It had um, like a, a New Zealand film board thing at the end, which threw me a little bit. But I, it it looks like it looks like Texas, you know. Yeah, a lot of places look like other places, right? This is true. This is true. There's a lot of Westerns being made in South Africa at the moment. And... Yeah, well, I grew up in New Jersey, right? Where the first or one of the first Westerns was made, so. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. What Western was that? All of them. All oh, right, right. <laughs> like 1890s, 1900s. Right, all the way through. Until right. they go I mean, to... we, we would go on field trips in elementary school to the Edison Museum, the Thomas Edison. I still have my little souvenir coin. I got to put that up on eBay. I bet that's worth something. <laughs> yeah. Thomas Edison on it. On you know, no monetary value. <laughs> Probably, but sentimental yeah. value only. But uh, that's yeah. right. He was giving away thousands of those. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Um, so. Uh, what what about your next project? What what are you uh, what are you looking towards working on next? Or are you just tired and want a bit of a rest? Well, both. I am tired, but um, yeah, there's nothing like bringing a project to fruition during um, lockdown. That's mm. fun. Um, I am thinking of a couple things: a biography of uh, a contemporary woman. I will say that. Um, mm -hmm. A, with a very well-known collaborator mm -hmm. so that's one thing that's a project that i've been wanting to do for a while but for various reasons it hasn't been able to happen but i'm also thinking of and i started kind of working on another project another making of book um uh about the women the movie the women 1939 oh, rosalind russell and rosalind russell norma shearer joan crawford um I see that as a as having a lot of a lot of cultural richness to write about, like a snapshot of um, female power at the height of the studio system, um, and also queer politics with George Cukor being involved. He had just been fired off of Gone with the Wind. Um, Shear and Crawford had a longtime rivalry. Uh, 1939, Hollywood's Greatest Year, you know, Wizard of Oz, uh, all these other films. So I see a lot there. One of the main problems is that, you know, MGM doesn't have sort of one archive like a lot of the studios do. So that could be um, a nightmare. But I'm, I'm really, I just saw it the other night, actually, with an audience at the Film Society. And um it was pretty amazing because this was the day after Roe v. Wade was overturned. And there is a line in the film spoken by Paulette Goddard um, where she says, a woman's compromised the day she's born. And, you know, this is a, that's a rollicking movie in a lot of ways. And people in the audience were laughing, you know, it was kind of crazy. And it just went silent in the audience. It was just this profound moment. Um, so I'm I'm toying with that. I don't know if that'll come to fruition, but I'm kind of excited about that. 
Well, that sounds really exciting. That sounds really interesting. I'm sure yeah. I, either one of those projects will be will be will be great. I'm looking forward to to reading your next work. And in fact, I'm going to go back and read your uh, Austin book for obvious reasons. Oh, re thank you. For obvious yeah. reasons. <laughs> that was that was fun to write. I, I I joke that the working title of that mo of that book was um, "Big Babies: The Men Who Made the Movies and the Tantrums They Threw," but. <laughs> There's a lot of that, isn't there? There's, There's a lot. lot. No, it was it was an interesting book to write. Um, it grew out of my being a film critic at that time, and mm. you know, really seeing Austin kind of break out and people saying, um, you know, just deservedly so, like, "Wow, Richard Linkletter's slacker." You know, that must that must have put Austin on the map, and it did. But you know, as a his trained historian, I was like, but there had to be things before that, right? So that really kind of started my whole um, deep dive for that project. Uh, really yeah. tracing film back. I mean, I don't write a lot about this, but tracing film back in Austin to the, you know, early 1900s um, and filmmakers like the Tilly brothers trying mm. to make, they made this movie called A Political it was actually somebody else made this movie, a political touchdown. So filming at all the big spots in Austin, like the Capitol. And I think that was 1915 even. Wow. Wow. Oh, well, I can't wait to read that. Definitely. But before um, we finish, I have to ask you for your recommended, your recommended film book. Oh, okay. What, what have you got for us, Alison? Um, oh, a really great biography by my former grad school cohort christina lane that book came out in 2021 phantom lady about joan a biography of joan harrison who um sort of started as alfred hitchcock's assistant but very quickly became a producer and christina writes about harrison really as one of she she segued into television too later as kind of an early showrunner which i love and it's just it won all these awards and it reads it has so much vitality it's a great book so that would be one recommendation and you should have her on your show too oh yeah absolutely and, um one of my favorite sort of making of books is um the studio by john gregory dunn um where he spent a year with pretty much all access to 20th century fox in the late 60s and so he's he spends a lot of time about writing about the production of Dr. Doolittle, which is just like, you know, it was sort of the end of the big, big blockbuster movie in that sense. Um, but he also touches on Planet of the Apes, um, but he had incredible access to both, you know, the, the money side and the creative side. And that's probably the last time a studio gave any journalist that much access to when they, the book came out, they're like, Oh crap. <laughs> but it, just, it is what I love about that book is that it just, you know, it, it lets the quotes sort of speak for themselves, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I, I like that. That is more my style of writing, I think, and rather than inserting myself in, um, you know, I feel pretty confident that I'm in there because I wrote the damn thing, you know, but also mm -hmm. the piecing together to me is, is more interesting. And I think um, he does that in, in an amazing way. And one of the things that sticks with me from that book is, you know, they had to build sets with drains in the floor because none of the, you know, animals were toilet trained. And so they had to bring that, you know, make that be a factor. Uh, you know, think of that as a line item on the budget. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yeah. Just think of how much that must have stank as well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> basically it did, I yeah. think. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. That's a that's a brilliant recommendation. And what was the name, <laughs> the name of the first book? Phantom Lady. Phantom Lady. And yeah. was, was that when Alfred Hitchcock was in America that she started as the production assistant? No, it was in... In, in Britain. Britain, I believe. Yeah, oh. yeah. Um, where she went and interviewed and for the job of an assistant. And it became very clear that she was a horrible assistant, but she, you know, she was very smart and they really bonded over their love of the workings of 
the court and things like that. And she quickly became a collaborator. And Christine, she's really, she's literally been written out of a lot of Hitchcock histories. And Christina does a great job, not just in, in you know, revising that story, but really in, in giving her her due as a pioneer. Um, and it's a great read. So yeah, Phantom Lady and then The Studio are my recommendations. Oh, fantastic, Alison. I really appreciate that. Um, that definitely, that's definitely going on my list. And, oh, great. Uh, and hopefully that will be a potential guest as well. That'd yes, yes, yeah, yeah. she's terrific. Super. Yeah. Thanks so much, Alison, for joining me. And um, yeah, good luck with the, with the book, which is, out, which is out right now. And people can get it wherever you get good books. Yes, thank you. This was so much fun to extend our conversation across the pond, so to speak. Okay, I'll cut there. Uh, Okay, so that was my conversation with Alison McCaw. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we obviously did. Her recommended books were Phantom Lady, Hollywood producer Joan Harrison, The Forgotten Woman Behind Hitchcock, uh, a book by Christina Lane, which I'm going to buy, read, and see if I can get Christina to come and be a guest on the show, and John Griffin Dunn's The Studio, which has been recommended a few times, but I love the way everybody who recommends it has a slightly different reason for recommending it. So I, I, I keep on recommending it. And we'll uh, and one of these days we'll get John Griffin done on to talk. No, we won't. Of course we won't. He's dead. I know. Don't, don't be silly, John. Don't be stupid. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Bad joke. Stupid boy. Okay. So um, uh, a bit of personal news that I'll just leave to the end, which I've already sort of shared on social media. So you probably already know, which is I'm writing a book myself. John Bleasdale is going to be a writer on film as well as the host of Writer on Film writers on film. Uh, I'm writing a biography about the film director Terence Malick, uh, which hopefully will be out in a couple of years, take me at least a year, two years to write it, I, I'm imagining. I've already made a really good start and uh, this book will be published by the University of Kentucky Press once it is done. I'm really excited about this and, you know, maybe uh, we can talk about it in future episodes. It'll be, uh, it'll be interesting for you to perhaps follow my adventures in what is I understand a quixotic quest to write a biography about an unbiographical <laughs> by about a I was going to try to invent a word but I'm, I'm giving up about a subject as elusive as Mr. Terence Malick so yeah to be continued as far as that is concerned thanks so much to Alison for being my guest thank you very much Elliot Atkins for providing the wonderful music thank you Ali Howard for the artwork and thank Thank you, listener, for joining me once again, and I will talk to you next week. <laughs>